Welcome to the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, the largest institution in the United States devoted to the arts, sciences, and artists of movie making. The Academy Museum of Motion Picture acknowledges the Tongva people as the traditional caretakers of the water and land on which we program, curate, educate, convene, and discuss. The Tongva community today, which continue to nurture this land and water through traditional practice, activism, art, and education. We also acknowledge their continued work to safeguard cultural resources. My name is Lohani Cook, and I'm the manager of public engagement here at the museum. Thank you for joining us in our David Geffen Theater for the Animated Features Film Nominee Program, presented as a part of our nominee programs. Nominee program support, support provided by Clarendell and Domain Clarence Dillon, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, Official Wines, and Delta Airlines. I would like to thank our ASL interpreters who will be assisting today. Their names are Anthony Diaz and Richard Loya. Nominee programs bring select screenings of Academy Award nominated shorts and panels with Academy Award nominated filmmakers in the lead up to the 96 Oscars to the Academy to the Academy Museum for the Public. Before we begin our program, please silence, darken, and stow your mobile devices, including phones and smartwatches. Now please help me in welcoming to the stage Michael Benedict, Associate Director of Member Relations and Awards Administration at the Academy Museum of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Oscar season animated feature film nominee panel. I'm Michael Benedict, Associate Director of the Short Films and Feature Animation Branch. I would like to thank everyone for coming out and supporting these incredible artists and films. This year, there was a record number of submissions with 33 eligible animated feature films that qualified and entered for consideration. From those 33 films, Academy members opt in to view and vote to determine which films become the Oscar nominees. Finals voting closed on Tuesday, and we will all find out which one of these five films will take home the Oscar next Sunday, March 10th, live on ABC. Each of these films is unique in animation techniques, budgets, and genres, but the unifying factor is that the work is exceptional. Congratulations to the nominees and their amazing teams. Thank you for sharing and bringing these stories to life. Speaking of teams, while I'm just one person representing the membership and awards department, I want to give a very special thank you to Lauren McPhee and Billy McClellan, who work closely with this category and members. I truly appreciate your hard work and dedication. This category is simply not possible without both of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Also, thank you to Pres President Janet Yang, Academy CEO Bill Kramer, and Chief Membership Officer Meredith Shea. These events are not possible without you. Thank you for your year-round support. We have a fantastic staff behind the scenes. Nobody can do these events alone. So I feel lucky to be part, a part of such a magnificent group of people who cherish movies and filmmakers. And finally, I want to thank all the Academy members who volunteered their time to view and vote. Please know how much we appreciate you and your dedication to cinema. You are experts in your craft who uphold the highest standards in filmmaking. Thank you for your commitment. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Governor of the Branch, Marlon West. For over 30 years, Marlon has worked as an animator, head of effects animation, and VFX supervisor at Walt Disney Animation Studios. His credits, you may have heard of them, include The Lion King, Pocahontas, Hercules, Princess and the Frog, Frozen, Moana, and Encanto. Not too bad. His newest project, Iwaju, was just released on Disney+. He, along with fellow branch governors Bonnie Arnold, and Jinko Goto are wonderful collaborators who are dedicated to their craft in cinema. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your moderator for the evening, Marlon West. Boy, that was, that was a nice introduction. I just want to thank you all for being here. And again, I thank you for being here on, on behalf of myself, our chair, Bonnie Arnold, and uh, my other co-governor, Jinko Goto. Um, to be honest, this is actually like, this little gig right here is uh, probably the, my, my, my favorite responsibility or I, as far as I'm concerned, perk of being a governor to come here and f visit and f have fellowship with these amazing storytellers and filmmakers. So um, the longer I stand here talking, um, 
the further we are away from here and them to tell those stories. So I'm going to I'm going to step on off of here. Um, people say this, you know, this is a small world, but I wouldn't want to paint it. But um, the animation world is smaller still. And uh, almost everybody who comes out is going to come out here. I, I, I know that either they're either a friend or I know from reputation or I've admired them from afar or I'm meeting them for the first time. Um, and um, so we're going to be starting in alphabetical order for an, an example of someone who I do admire from very far, who couldn't be here today, Hideo Miyazaki. And uh, we're going to be going in reverse order. So we're starting with the boy and the heron. So I'd like to introduce this clip of the film and the first public remarks that uh, Brother Miyazaki has ever actually made about this film. And when it finishes, we're going to roll right into a clip from Elemental, and then I'm going to come out here and, uh, and chit-chat. So I'll see you in a little bit. お前は何者だ。ただの青崎じゃないだろう。どうやら長い間待ち続けたお方が現れたようだ。いざ母君の元へご案内しましょうぞ。母君ふざけるな。母さんは死んだんだ。ええ。人間のよくやる手だね。信じ合いませんよ。失礼ながらあなたは母君のご遺体を見ていないでしょう。母君はあなたの助けを待っていますぞ。おいでください。おいでください。おいでください。おいで。おいで。おいで。おいで。君たちはどう生きるかが長編アニメーション部門にノミネートされて大変嬉しく思っています。アカデミー協会と投票してくださった皆様に感謝します。皆さん、この作品というのは自伝なんですか？いや、でもこの中にあったことですね。そういうことだ
That was nice, wasn't it? Um, so I, I'd like to uh, bring out the director of this wonderful film, Peter Show. Thanks, Marlon. That's a trip to come out after that interview with Miyazaki. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm hoping you'll give me a little bit more than that, man. Help, help, no, help, I, I mean, like, it's funny because I also chuckled with you guys when he said it was interminable, but that is animation. It, it's, it, it is. It really is. Like, it's, you put so much of your heart into it, and they take a long time. And, uh, um, but then you're also, like, honored to be like, whoa, that's Miyazaki and the Boy and the Heron, and you're, you know images that you guys are you know, creating are being shared on the same screen. It's, uh, it's humbling, to say the least. That was cool, man. It was well-deserved, man. And um, so let me just, let's, let's, let's jump into it a little bit. You know, I, um, I'm going to be honest. I, I'm, I'm a brother who believes that, like, you know, race is a completely kind of, like, s social construct. And so when people are, uh, are usually kind of shy away from films that I think are race parables that suggest we are different from one another, physically different from one another. But man, when I saw your film, it's an immigrant story. Yeah. It's not what it's really about. And, and it's about these, these fire people coming to a world that's not really built for them. And uh, it, it really kind of blew my mind. So can, can you talk to me a little bit about, the, about the, how you came up with this story? Yeah. Um, I, you know, so much of... The, 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 you know, making something like this just come from feelings that you have. And uh, the sort of the initial seed for this whole thing came from an event that uh, I did this radio show promoting some work before. Uh, and uh, I said that I was born in the Bronx. And uh, a couple of days later, the Bronx literally called. The, the, the mayor's office said, hey, you're a son of the Bronx. We'd love to celebrate the arts and what you've done as a son of the Bronx and come over. And... Uh, I was like, okay, can I bring my parents? I go to this event, uh, um, and uh, my parents are all dressed up. I had the speech that was sort of making fun of, you know, the work that I had done. Uh, but when I got up on stage and saw this audience, uh, my parents were there, and my mother was crying, and uh, my father was doing that, I'm holding it all in, but I'm not going to cry sort of face. <laughs> and uh, uh, it hit me really hard. I saw their age, and I saw essentially all the sacrifices that they had made over the years is just sort of ingrained in the folds and the wrinkles of their of their of their lives and uh, um, I got very emotional on stage and uh, I thanked them for their sacrifices for giving a life for, to my brother and I here they came from Korea in the 60s and uh, and uh, went through really tough times and uh, I went back to work with this anecdote people were asking how that event was and uh, because I think I was making fun of it so much prior. <laughs> and when I went there, it became so meaningful to me to the actual gratefulness and physical act of being grateful to uh, people in your lives. And uh, um, my boss was just like, hey, that's, that's the next movie you have to do. And so that was the initial seed, this feeling, this wow. feeling of gratefulness and uh, what it means to be a foreigner and come from another place and try to build you know, a, a, a life. And that's what started this whole thing. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. So, you know, this film doesn't have like a villain. You know, right. Spoiler alert, y'all. Yeah. Um, and this, this, this is a the, the, the conflict and the, and the drama comes from from ideas and feelings. Um, how did you arrive at that, or what, what are some of the things that you, you wanted to talk about with this? Well, uh, you know. The idea of what a community is and what it means to pass the torch to another generation from that community uh, was something that was very constrictive when I was growing up. Uh, my grandmother and my family were very insular within the Korean community in New York. And uh, when, you know, I come from a bunch of males, there's no daughters in, in my generation, uh, which is the uh, cousins are all guys. And, uh, our grandmother's dying words were to all of us of like, marry Korean. Ugh. And then like she like passed away. But she said it in Korean. She was like, you know, like it, was, <laughs> it was legit. And uh, I, remember this, I remember this pressure, uh, uh, you know, and uh, I, you know, later I fell in love with someone that wasn't Korean. And uh, it created so much anxiety and culture clash within the family, you know, uh, just in terms of like 
my mother, how am I supposed to speak to this person? There will be a language barrier. How are they going to know what New Year's is for Asian people? And all of this sort of thing. And uh, um, uh, my talking to my partner, my wife, who would say, sort of bring up the tough parts of it, but then the hilarious parts of it. And mm -hmm. a lot of that started this other side of that story of being within an immigrant sort of family. And that there were many stories like this, um, but something that I really loved trying to do was trying to build a culture within elements and seeing how they can you know, uh, see each other and uh, open up to see each other and uh, find, you know, you know, my father uh, was ignorant about many things and uh, so many times that I see that that little step of empathy toward anyone that would come to the store, you know, everything would change, you know, and uh, that little nugget was sort of the seed of trying to, you know, uh, put forth in the in the movie of just like, it's one of the most simplest things and yet sometimes it's so hard. But to open that door to empathy, you know, um, um, will create gigantic bridges and create connections that you've, you, you'd never imagine. And it's really cool. So, you know, I'm, a, I'm an effects guy and I do, I've done a lot of fire or water and explosions and blowing things up, but you've, oh, got, yeah. you've got some main characters that are living effects. Can you talk to me a little bit about how to make a, how you arrived at making a, a fire person who doesn't look like a person on fire? Yeah. How does, how did, how creatively, because that's hard, y'all. You can take it for granted. Yeah. Once you yeah. do something like this, you're like, of course that's what a fire lady looks like. <laughs> but as you know, and everybody who's gonna come out here knows, yeah. It's a long path to get to what that fire lady looks like, or, or, or any of your characters. Can you talk about yes. that journey? Um, Marlon, I love you knowing this from your heart because of your experience in it. And uh, my love for 2D effects uh, um, was part of the initial excitement because that's how the drawing started as. They were just these little, almost like a calcifer from Howl's Moving Castle, sort of abstract characters. And, uh, uh, but they were all ink drawings. Um, but they were very graphic. Uh, and then once I pitched the idea of like, could we do this in the computer, um, it split our studio, or at least uh, some of the, the teams that were supporting me, it split them where they were like, fire is too busy. You would not be able to look at a face. Mm -hmm. There's no way. Um, our, our head of our studio, uh, Jim Morris, worked at ILM for a long time, and they had done back tests on backdraft this movie about fire, and uh, they had created, there was a character, like a monster in fire, and it was so terrifying, and, uh, and so that was the worry. Could an audience connect to the landscape of an effect like that, of, as a face? And uh, so it was just, you know, the film took a long time because there was no pipeline at the studio. We were used to making car characters or plastic toys, but to create a character that was solely fluid and an effect um, was scary, but that's what was exciting me. Um, it was ignorance, too, just because I did not know how difficult it would ultimately be. Um, but it was the balance of, like, you know, what can the computer do? And, you know, so we, they turned the fire on, put some eyes on it, and it literally looked like a Balrog from Lord of the Rings. Right, so just right. Like, yeah. That is terrifying. It's, you know, it's like every horror movie that you've seen when it's <laughs> blinking at you and you just want the voice to be, you know, um, um, really heavy. But... Uh, from there, it was trying to find this balance and this caricature between what was 2D fire, which, you know, you can caricature and make the audience feel like it's fire, even though it's not going to move exactly like realistic fire. And so we were talking to Disney FX guys uh, that were helping us understand how you could cheat the look mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a lot of sprints toward there just to get the flame right. And uh, we used AI to get the flame, you know, and it was very, very um, uh, a, t a tough conversation to have about just bringing AI into the flames. But, uh, um, you know, as an, anim as an animation lover, all of us, that the DNA of that first flip book or that first sort of thing when that persistence of vision starts to trigger frame by frame. Yeah, yeah. You know, that happened with Ember, our main character, where, you know, so much of this work is you have a, a big black hole where you're like, uh, make the fire not too real. And you just throw this idea into a black hole. You don't get anything, any response from it. And months and months after just throwing ideas in, we sat in a the theater and then she came to life for the first time. And uh, it was uh, really, really emotional, but vomity because 
we had water to do and air and earth. And, <laughs> right. uh, um, you know, I had spent so much of the budget just trying to get Ember to work. Right. And uh, that idea of what you said about like, it's, it's the difficulty of it isn't immediately seen, you know, when no. you see it, uh, which is the goal. Like you don't want to like be thinking about the effect. Yeah, everybody here is supposed to feel like, of course this is what right. water world and, yeah. and clouds folks look like. Yeah. You're not, you're not supposed to be like sitting there watching this film going, damn, that shit look hard. Oh, damn. Yeah, yeah. But, I'm going to have to get bleeped. Yeah, but, but live I, streaming. But I will right. say um, the water character, Wade, was the nightmare. He was impossible. He, we were tweaking him all the way to the end. The idea of what a refraction is and what reflection is uh, on him, when you put him in a basement, he disappears. When you put him in daylight, he bl you know, blows out the lenses. He just becomes mm -hmm. this hot white thing. And uh, um, you slow the, the movement down, he becomes jello. And uh, uh, you know, he, there's a shot in the movie of when uh, Wade is gonna step into incoming water and he grows from it. There's one shot where he places his hand on it and each one of those frames took a thousand hours to render because of the translucency. And so wow. it really brought the Pixar render farms to its knees, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, it was crazy. Man, well, thank you so much, Peter. It's so, yes. so cool to finally meet you in person and to talk about your wonderful film. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> We're going to look at a clip from Nimona. I'll be right back. Yeah. Who are you? The name's Nimona. Oh. So, about the job. <laughs> what job? Oh, look, it's Glory. To be your sidekick. You know, to help you do whatever it takes to get revenge on the cold, cruel world that rejected you. I'm innocent. Who do you want to kill first? Can't stop me now. Find Ballister and bring him to me. <laughs> this is the part where you run. Can't stop me now. Oh, Golden ear. <laughs> you ever put your head in the mouth of one of these? Come on! You know you wanna! Who is she? You wanna show him? No matter what we do, we can't change the way people see us. She's a monster. They grew up believing that they can be a hero if they drive a sword into the heart of anything different. Sometimes, I just want to let them. I'm sorry. I see you, Nimona. And you're not alone. No, I'm going to work with you. I'm, I'm, I'm workshopping this now, you all. Um, because they wanted me to walk on and off. And then I was saying, I don't want to just sit there. I don't want to walk on and off. That seems like a little too much. So I thought, well, I wanted to walk, walk Pete out. And it, but anyway, I, I might sit here next time. I don't know. Y'all let me know. Just let me know how it was, how it's working. <laughs> but OK, so I, I want to bring out these wonderful filmmakers. Troy Kwan, Karen Ryan, and Julie Zachary. Please come on out. <laughs> Troy, I'm sorry I didn't hug you, man. This is, we'll get ready to go. This is cool. Isn't it kind of cool out here? Oh my God. Coolest yeah. theater in the world. Um, so, I don't want to turn my chair too. I feel like I want to be you can do whatever you look, want. Looking at looking at y'all. Sit where you want. Okay. Just turn your chair. Um, 
so it takes a long time to make an animated feature and they're really hard to do. Um, this one was particularly hard to, to, to finish and uh, you know, whoever wants to pick, pick this up, but. Which, which time? Yeah. We have 10 oh. minutes or can we take like four hours <laughs> to walk through? Yeah, we take four minutes. Yeah, we four minutes. we made uh, we essentially made Nimona twice. Um, you, I mean, you were there with the longest in the blue sky version, so I'll let you take it over. Animation, I mean, they usually take a very long time, and you can feel all the dedication that goes into it. Nimona started ten years ago at Blue Sky Studios, um, and had been through kind of you know. There's typical production challenges that happen, and when schedules last so long, like people come and go, and it becomes a whole thing. But Nimona was really special at Blue Sky. Um, I joined in 2018 when I left you at Disney. Marlon and I go way back. I am mad at yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but um, Nimona was a, a film at Blue Sky that the entire crew became a part of, like everybody in the studio. Troy and Nick opened up the conversations about what the movie meant to everybody, to every single person there, and they showed up like in droves. It was the entire studio. So we were making this film. Uh, the pandemic happened, and we were all like, we felt like we were doing something really special and really fun uh, from our homes, and it was kind of getting us through. And we got to the screening that you see that came out there. That was basically the movie. About ninety five percent of the movie. Yeah, we were supposed to screen that for the crew on a Thursday, and on the Tuesday before is when we found out that the studio was closing and the film was canceled. Um, so it was, yeah, you, you can't write it like this is a movie in itself. You wouldn't want to. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. This was... movie has gone through a studio merger. It's gone through a studio closure. It's gone through a studio acquisition, and it's now out. To now look at you. So now. this has been this has been a journey. Tenacity. I think filmmaking is stubbornness to begin with. This was uh, exponential. <laughs> Indeed. So, um, the mode was first, first based on a on a comic, on a graphic novel by Indy Stevenson. Can you talk to a little bit about the process of uh, adaptation and? Yeah. Um, I mean, working with the original creator. Indy. Was uh, wrote an incredible graphic novel. Um, it, was, it was from the heart. It was a story. He started back in art school, um, a couple panels at a time, a couple pages at a time. Just you know, we like to say that just messages in a bottle out into the digital universe, uh, waiting to see if anybody sent a message back. And they did. People fell in love with it. They fell in love with these characters. They fell in love with that journey. Uh, and you know that turned into a deal with Har uh, Harper Collins. They turned it into a award-winning graphic novel, uh, 14 different languages around the world. Um, and when you take over something like that, you just don't want to screw it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's your job, not to screw it up. But the other side of it is adaptation isn't just copying, right? You have to find right. a way through it. Uh, any of you, have, if you've read the graphic novel, you know it goes into an amazingly wide array of places. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's fantastic. And you can get lost in that as a, as a filmmaker, as a storyteller. I mean, we had sequences where we were on a luxury yacht sailing to a hidden island where the Institute is filming propaganda, monster video. Like, it goes crazy places. Um, and it's because we, we started to get lost in the possible details of a story as opposed to what right. the story is about. And that's what film is. That's what animation does best is, is what is the story about? And it's about the characters. Um, it's finding that connection. What was the message that Nimona was sending to the audience? And it's... It really was this love letter to anybody who's felt othered, anybody who's felt outside of, different, who wished they could change form to fit in, or at the very least, not stand out. And it was something that really resonated with the LGBTQ plus community in, in, in the studio. And, and we realized that was the element that we shouldn't be dancing around. That right. was the element we need to lean into. It was what, what the DNA of, of the story was telling us. I, this artsy fartsy idea that if you really listen, a story will tell you what it wants to be. The characters will tell you who they need to be, and your job is simply to listen and, and make sure you bring that out. Um, and it was the most humbling experience getting to work with ND, who, as a creator, it must be really tough to have such a personal story and then hand it over to to a bunch of strangers to say like, "Take care of my baby." Um, but he was so giving and willing and understanding that Nimona, the the story he wrote, had to change shape yet again become of this movie and it's funny because we we watched the movie when it was finally done and you're, you're so ingrained and you're so like this close to it 
And I remember we did our, like one of our first screenings and someone said like, wow, it's really interesting how different the film is from the graphic novel. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's exactly the same. <laughs> and I went back and read the book. I'm like, oh my God, it's so different from the graphic novel. But you don't realize that you're doing it. You're just, but the, you're, core, the core of it. The is, heart. Yeah, you know, the heart that's the, the key same. in adaptation is finding the heart of it and making sure that that is what resonates with truth. Um, the details are details, but if that resonates, you're, you're in good shape. That's really cool. You actually already touched on what was going to be my, my, my next question was the representation in, in, in this film and uh, how much you were able to weave that in through, through subtlety and sometimes very, very overt. Can you talk about the, your, your process with that? Yeah. Um, again, if you read the graphic novel, it's just, it's all the themes that Indy was exploring. Mm -hmm. um, in a very personal way, and the people working on the movie were exploring it in a very personal way as well. And we made a decision early on to, a lot of times in film, especially animation, um, we put in thematics that are subtext, right? This idea represents this, this idea represents that. We made a very conscious choice that in this film we wanted to make subtext text. We weren't gonna dance around the fact of two men who loved each other because it was integral for the movie that, that these two people love each other, whether they're two men, a male, female, didn't matter, it was about love. Um, and it was about being honest in reflecting the world we see around us. And uh, we hired Riz Ahmed, who does an incredible job as Ballister in his film. He does this incredible talk, you can find it online um, for the House of Commons in the UK, and it really is about visibility of seeing yourself in the entertainment and the media you consume and how important it is for people to feel represented, for diversity to be present, for inclusivity to be, you know, honest. Um, he talks about, you know, feeling like he's part of a kingdom, the United Kingdom, but an outcast in a, in a kingdom that he is a, a, a citizen of. And that was something that we took very much to heart. Um, like, we want to entertain. Hopefully you've seen the movie. Hopefully you laughed and you cried and you had fun in the adventure. Um, but when you have a platform, you, you also feel like you have an opportunity and a responsibility to express certain ideas, and certain thoughts, and certain truths. And that was really important for us. Um, it's uh, a group of people right now, of youth that are at most at risk in our country, um, not just being disliked, but rights being repealed and revoked. Um, it's, I think, now more than ever important to just recognize that we're all people, we're all on a journey, we're all humans trying to find our way through this thing. And if we can do that with some, some entertainment, then, then hopefully the job is well done. Yeah, super, you did, you did the hell out of that. Karen, were you getting ready yeah. to say something? I wanna add Go to ahead. that. Just Go something, um, the themes and the characters in our movie are part of the reason why we experience pushback while making this and challenges to even get the movie out. Like we had it done and then even just marketing it and getting it seen and getting it recepted from people. It was a struggle and it shouldn't be. But what gave me hope, and I know I speak for these guys, and you should jump in. When we were working on this movie, every person that we met that we asked for help, like resonated, wanted the movie to be seen, and helped us. So like we got pushed back from certain places, but the people that we met believe in this and want this to be not something that's like rare or not something that you don't see. They want it. So like there's hope out there. And if we all just keep pushing for the stories that we want to see and we make the stories that reflect the world that we live in and the people that we care about and people who we are, we will do it. So I I've, I've walked out of this feeling really good about the future of what's coming. <laughs> cool. Cool. Julie, did you have something to say on that? Only just to um, emphasize what um, um, my partners have already said about um, making sure that we were very intentional about diversity, and we were very intentional about diversity. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times we sat in reviews when we were like, "Where's the female knights?" Let, you know, where like there's why do we only hear men's voices um, and the background characters? Uh, and Nimona was really important to us to show this medieval future, but it was you know kind of like the world that we live in. There's a lot of technology, there's a lot of advancement, but there's a lot of really old thinking. And we're kind of at this, you know, this like um, point where we're we're kind of discovering the new, but also um, kind of stuck in the old. And Nimona was the world that we lived in, so it was very important to show an equal amount of men and women on stage or on screen, rather, and also having um, same-sex couples. Because guess what? Gay people exist. They exist in Nimona, and they list, they they exist here too. And it was very important for us to make that world a world that we reflected, that was real and authentic. I appreciate that. Um, I, I just wanted to point out something that you actually said, Julie, and uh, just to put a finer 
point on it, but um, to, to be in the room to actually say, there need to be more female knights up in here, or there need to be more female voices up in here, um, because that doesn't occur to everybody no. to say that. So um, bravo, and, uh, and, that, and I think the diversity behind, of, of this, behind the screen, the people who are making these decisions about what goes on screen is very important, not just to, to those characters out there, but the folks that are actually creative. So I'm, 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 I'm glad you mentioned that as an aside, because being in the room is super important. So I want to thank the three of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks I think everybody. I'm going to stand out, sit out here on my chair during trans this next transition. All right, please enjoy this clip of our, oh yeah, oh, Robot Dreams. Like, I, I just went to double check. Yeah. Could you please welcome Pablo Berger? It's a pleasure to meet you. Hi. Oh, Hello. I, so I, I've been wanting to meet you because I uh, <laughs> I, I love this film, and um, so I was looking forward to this. Um, so you're a longtime live action filmmaker. You've made several live action films. And so, why would you do something crazy like jump into animation for a feature? Yeah, I, I feel like a first-time director, and this is my fourth film. Uh, uh huh. Yeah, so I think that's exciting to start all over again, to get out of your comfort zone. But the reason is a, a graphic novel with the same name, Robot Dreams, mm -hmm. by Sarah Baron. I read it 10 years ago, or even, even, even a little more, 14 years ago, because I collect graphic novels without dialogue. And I read it, I said, oh, it's nice. It's one of my favorite. I put it back on the shelf. And, and let me interrupt you for a second. Because you're <laughs> saying in red, if, you, if you've seen the graphic novel, there is no dialogue, like yes. you said, but there's no direction in it either. It is purely graphic images, <laughs> yes. beautiful images. Yeah, and, and, the, and, and that's the thing, that when I, I went through it, like I made two films, Blanca Nieves, Abracadabra, and you know, five years ago, I took it again, and I went through the pages, and when I got to the end, you know, I ended with tears, but truly tears. I was completely moved. And that didn't happen the first time I read it. And I realized that I have lost a lot of people on the way. Those eight years, I lost my parents, I lost one of my best friends, and I said like, wow, I'm making substitutions. So that fact, I thought maybe if I make this film into an animated film, other people are going to, it's gonna happen what I, what I did, that when they watch the film, they're gonna think about people that they love, that they're not with them anymore. Yeah, that's beautiful, brother. I am. Um, so I, I was watching this film, and it is it, its eye for detail is amazing. So I, I, a little bit of research. You and I are the exact same age, okay. which I'm not going to say what that is. <laughs> but your eye for details for New York in 1988, yeah, is off the chain. <laughs> Thank you, uh, yeah. So can, can, talk to me about. Okay. The, the, the Why you placed it? Because that, that is not from the graphic novel. No, in the graphic novel is it's American any, City. It, yeah, it's like could be anywhere. Generic, it could be anywhere, but 
But I live in New York for 10 years, and also one of my closest collaborators is here in the room is Yuko Haramis. He also lived in New York for 10 years. We made four films together, so she's mommy, I'm daddy. <laughs> she doesn't like that I say that she's also my wife, but she's, but she's our baby, so Robot Dreams. So we wanted to make this love letter to New York. We really, you know, and we wanted the audience, when they come to see this film, that they sit on the seat and they think they're in a H.G. Wells time machine. I want people to travel in time to a New York that vanished. You know, you know how it was. Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> no, no cell phones, no internet. It was, a, it was, it was an AG, AG, yeah. town, AG city and so many things happening. So we wanted that, that experience. So every detail had to be right. So it had to be, we didn't want people to think, what is, Japanese and a Spaniard and a bunch of French people making a film about New York, people were going to like, boo. So he said, no, they cannot boo. They want to say, no, man. yes, you got it right. You got it right. Do you even <laughs> got how to eat a Brooklyn slice right? <laughs> yes. I was like, man, <laughs> did your homework. <laughs> yeah, we did the homework. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, I've, I've been in, in animation my entire career. I've worked on a lot of films and uh, animated films, often very chatty. I may mean, sing a lot too, but very chatting. People explaining a lot of stuff, talking a lot of things. This film doesn't have any dialogue. Can you talk to me about the the, the bravery, man, of just of going there? Well, the the thing is that before a director, I'm an I'm an I'm a cinephile. I love cinema. So my favorite period is silent cinema. I made before ten years ago a film called Blanca Nieves that had no dialogue. It was also wordless. So I enjoy so much that part of you know, a sensorial experience of cinema. You know, you you feel things. You don't, you kind of like, I think a film should be more like a film, like a concert or like like a ballet. So I, so I, I think there's so many things to be said as a cinema, just writing with images. So I, I, for me, more than a challenge, it was just more like a, I wanted to continue. I wanted to make films that really uses like beautiful compositions and, you know, very internal emotions to, to come across by with the images. Yeah, man. I am. Um, I was very moved by by the fact that you know that most of this film are are, are dreams, dreams that are or, or not realized. Yeah. Spoiler alert. You know. <laughs> um, and it's very, very, very poignant, and you're rooting for these characters <laughs> the whole time. And so much, so many of the the dreams are some. Some of them are right, you know, from the from the graphic novel, but some of them aren't. And one one of my favorites is when, you know, you're using like the film frame where it comes out of the bottom of the frame, and that that was just so cool. But what I know you brought some of these to the screen yourself. That some of these are your own creations. Can you talk to me about some of your favorites uh, of these oh, dreams? Well, Marlon, you've done your homework good, eh? Maybe I, just, I watched it, watched it, and loved yeah, it. Yeah, you're really, really. <laughs> well, there's no, it's no. <laughs> It's no spoiler, it's called Robot Dreams, so they're dreams, you know. Yeah, and, they're dreams. And you know, we all know about cinema. We said, oh, don't, don't put dreams in the film, but we're not cheating. That's the title. So it's the title. They're dreams. You know, they're surreal moments, they're magic, they're things from the subconscious. And I think that's the fun of it, you know. And, and, and some of the dreams, they were in the, in the graphic novel, but many others not, you know. And especially, we, we have this, you know, without being a spoiler, there's a homage to... Hollywood musicals, Busby Berkeley. You know, it's not in yeah. the graphic novel, but you know, this is the amazing thing about animation. Once you try it, you cannot you cannot get out of it. You know, because with the budget, I was able with a European budget, I was able to make thousands and thousands of tap dancers. Yeah, you know, can you imagine? It's almost, so that's that's a, a big dream sequence, and of course, you know, I I think film cinema is to dream awake. I honestly think the magic of cinema is when you the lights turn off, and you really get into the screen. So, so that's just the kind of film I like. For me, my favorite scene in cinema, it's one of my favorites in The Purple Rose of Cairo when Mia Farrow, she's had a terrible experience through the whole film, and at the end, she's alone, and she gets into the cinema, and she watches a musical with Fred Astaire and Jill Rogers, and just like, she starts the scene crying, and then there's a big smile on her. So for me, that's cinema. Thank you. Do, do you've uh, you've made a you've Thank made you. a wonderful, wonderful film, and I you know I assume anybody who's sitting here on a Saturday afternoon. It was raining when I got here this morning, but it was sunny when I walked in, in 
He's probably seen all of these movies at least once. Uh, so I don't, I don't feel too bad about spoiling stuff. <laughs> um, and if you haven't, thank you for coming out sight unseen. <laughs> Hurry up and watch these babies before next Sunday. Um, well, Pablo, it was a, man, it was a total pleasure to meet you, man. I've been such a huge fan of this film, and um, it's just a, a beautiful work of art. So yeah. thank you, and congratulations. Yeah, thank you, Marlon. It was a pleasure. And, now, and the thing is that most of you probably you haven't seen the film because the film hasn't been theatrically released, only like a limited release. So oh, dang. in May, Neon distributes the film. I had to do some product placement. Oh, Marlon. man. Well, yeah. You well, know? All right. And now we have a screening... Uh, in, in the area, no? <laughs> please, yeah, pl if you get yeah, the opportunity, need... please go out and yes, see Yes, yes. Come to see Robot Dreams to the, in, the, in, the, in the best cinemas. Yeah, by all means. On the big screen. Yeah. Thank you, Marlon. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. All right, now please enjoy this clip for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I'm going to hang here. And I'm trying to be good, too. I was trying so hard to wear this thing the way you would want. And I didn't. I didn't. I can do all these things, but I can't help the people I love the most. And they can only know half of who I am. So I'm, I'm completely on my own. And now I don't, I don't even know what the right thing is anymore. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I know. I can't lose one more friend. When I always taught you to do it by the book. Yeah, and how did that work out? I took an oath. Then arrest me, Dad. Get it over with. I... I can't. Why not? Because I quit. When? About halfway through your big speech. You're... Wait a minute, you're not, you're not gonna be captain? That means... My job, being captain, this whole thing doesn't matter anymore. You're the best thing I've ever done. Okay, okay. Could you please bring out directors Justin K. Thompson and Kim Powers and producers Christopher Miller and Phil Lord. All right. And thanks, thanks for, thanks for, Sitting here with me, um, you know, Chris and Bill. I'll start. I'll, I'll start with this one for for the two of you. Um, so the first film blew everybody away. Is total. People, I think it's safe to say a game changer in many many ways. And um, and you decided to go back in again. <laughs> um, so talk to me about about not only making another one, but clearly set a, a, a middle chapter for a trilogy. How, how did you get your minds around that? I mean, the main thing was to just be more ambitious. You know, like the cover of a successful film and the opportunity to go back into it, um, it just means you you can't play safe. And I think even for the first year or so, we we were all a little tight, trying like not to, like we can't, you can't play like prevent defense. You know, you have to be aggressive. and. I think once we reminded ourselves of that, um, you know, the governor came off and we like, 
and we all went for it. And I think we knew making the first one, it was really hard to sort of get something that looked like nothing you'd ever seen before, but we also knew we were just scratching the surface of what was possible. And the idea that we could have this movie take place in a bunch of different worlds and have each world look like it was from the hand of a different artist and have the whole world feel completely different from the other seemed really exciting. Uh, and it also seemed like it was a way to do a, a movie that didn't feel like you're just with a sequel, you're all, often like, oh, I'm just going to do this. The thing that worked again, everyone likes right. it and they want to see it. But this way, we were like, we can do something that doesn't feel at all like the first movie, but still is a thing that people didn't know that they want, but uh, but hopefully are excited to see. Yeah, it's really cool. And you, I think you nailed it because, yeah, it, it does, it, it feels like an expansion, not like, it's about reverse again. <laughs> Justin, now you were um, you were the production designer of the first film and in the director's chair on this one. Uh, talk to me about that transition, brother. Um, well, I was always obsessed with telling stories, and the way I've always told stories, and the way I've so, and the reason why I have a relationship with Phil and Chris for so long is because I've always, even though yes, I, I started as a production designer, I've, I was a storyteller first. And I just invested in heavily in the internal dialogue that characters are having and how I could figure out cool visual ways and, and smart visual ways to externalize what characters were really going through and help tell their stories, externalize them onto screen. Um, what could the, I always have approached it, what could the movies, what could the film say that the characters couldn't say for themselves? So that clip you just saw, you know, it was a matter of like when Gwen can't cry for herself, can the film cry for her? Mm -hmm. Can the walls cry for her? And so honestly, when, when they asked me, you know, if I would consider directing, to me it felt like a natural extension of what I've already been doing for so long, which is telling stories and being in that chair uh, with Kemp and, and Joaquin de Santos, uh, my, my fellow directing partners, it really was just a, an extension of how, and it gave me even more opportunity to tell even great, in even more powerful ways, externalizing that internal story that I've been trying to tell for so long. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, now, Kim, speaking of being a storyteller, you've been a journalist, playwright, screenwriter, I direct an that this is your second animated feature. Um, Talk to me about that journey, but from the written word to this, this visual thing. That's a big story. I mean, circuitous, I guess, is the best way <laughs> to describe it. No, I mean, similar to what Justin said, it's just about narrative storytelling. I've always been a big fan of film. I, I don't come from a background in animation, but I've always had a lot of, tr like, a tremendous respect for animation storytelling as being some of, like, the, the most elegant, the cleanest, you know, the most emotional uh, storytelling in cinema. That's actually what initially brought me over to Pixar. It wasn't from a background in animation. It was a background as a writer, and I was elevated to being, you know, a co-director um, on Soul there. And I was lucky enough to see. Thank you. I was I was lucky Great. enough to see um, a very uh, into the Spider Verse before it came out in theaters. We were still in production on Soul, so they brought the film um, up to, you know, up to up to Pixar. And just like everyone else, it, Pixar is a tough crowd. So just like, and Pete Stone will tell you that, like I think he was there too that day, because um, I know Pete for several years. And you know, all of us kind of had to pick our jaws up off the floor. So when I was wrap, when I was getting ready to wrap up on Soul and people were like, well, do you want to do any more animation? I was like, well, I don't know, but I'd be really curious to see what's going on with those guys at Sony because they obviously don't have any rules because like that movie just like <laughs> broke every, Rule and and that led very quickly to um, an introduction to to Phil and Chris and when they told me that they were um, you know planning to do a sequel to Spider Verse what what really interested me was that I mean by that within it seemed like almost immediately after Into the Spider Verse came out people were doing films that kind of had element it was obvious its influence on oh, the yeah. entire industry what excited me about this film was one the story they were trying to tell more mature Miles focusing on family. Because um, I think one of the most interesting things about Miles Morales that makes him different than Peter Parker is that he has both his parents and he has a relationship with them. And, you know, as a parent myself of a teenage boy, I thought that the journey he was going on in this film, like, spoke to me personally. The other thing was 
they weren't replicating any of the style of this first film, which had all, it was already influencing the animation industry, and the attitude was, and we don't want to do any of that again. We want to actually not even follow ourselves, which would have been the easy thing to do, but we want to kind of create new tools, create a new visual language. So, so for me, it's, it's always been about like just being pulled to the best storytellers, the best storytelling, working with some of the best people. And this, you know, to me, I feel like I, felt like I fit like a glove um, with this particular team on this film. But it was, it was natural. Oh, that's really cool. I remember um, seeing the, I think it was a teaser trailer for, for the first Spider-Verse. And it, and it dropped on, I don't know if that was on purpose or not, but it was Father's Day. And it was the scene of Miles' dad dropping him off at school. And he's like, you got to say I love you, Miles. <laughs> Say, say I love you, Miles. And I was like, "Damn, that kind of like is my father." <laughs> I, I knew my, I, I knew my, 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 my good friend Peter Ramsey was directing. I was like, "I really see um, there's some authenticity to this." And as much as to you all have made these two films that are full of pyrotechnic of, of visual effects. Oh, and by, by, by the way, let me just, I'm going off script. I mentioned visual effects. I was here for the effects bake-off sitting, sitting over there, and Spider-Verse, an animated film, was up in here with the, with the live action folks representing, so bravo on that. But Thank you. I just had to, I had, I had to in interrupt my own question <laughs> to give that shout out. But talk to me about the, uh, and this is for the four of you, about Authenticity uh, and, and, and the realness that both of these films have had um, because you know, these folks, they've been Im imitated as far as their style and, and, and you all have been super applauded. But man, there's some realness to, to, to this film. And that's like the, kind of the irony is that like, yeah, they're swinging and crashing and bashing and shooting webs and stuff, but really the stuff that people remember the most and the stuff that we worked on the hardest were the small intimate scenes of people talking to each other, like Miles and his mom having a conversation about her sort of letting him go out of the nest. Uh, Miles and Gwen upside down talking to people who like, like have a complicated relationship with each other and have a lot of feelings and want to sort of live in the moment together. Like the subtlety of those scenes and from the writing, from an acting, from a voice and from a like, from a visual language, all of it <clears throat> was so much sort of it's a it's a family drama disguised as a superhero <laughs> movie. <laughs> yeah. um, and like just even from an animation standpoint, like those shots were so much harder and got so much more attention to like how's he gonna pick his little uh, little piece of lint off of his leg and what the little glance that she gives him and all that type of stuff. It was like a lot of discussions about that. And when it was like, oh, I want to swing around and punch a guy in the face. They're like, yeah, that looks great. That's great. Moving on. <laughs> um, so that's really what, what we cared about. And this ended up being the most iconic parts of the, parts of the film. It's, it's interesting, too. Like, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. But, you know, when we discuss things like diversity and inclusion and authenticity, I found in my more than decade in this business that those are topics that people do not want to hear from me. Let's just be real. If a black guy starts talking about it, people just tune out. So I just do it. <laughs> and guess what? When yeah. I just don't ask anyone and don't make a case for why you should and just do it, it starts magically appearing in movies. And everyone on this team was asked to just bring their authentic selves to this film. I didn't even know Phil was Cuban until we started working together. And he was like making comments about the the food at the barbecue, and all of a sudden I'm like, "Oh, you speak Spanish?" He's like, "Yeah, my family was Cuban." Like it was, <laughs> so all we were doing was just bringing our authentic selves to the film. We didn't ask anyone, and we just did it, and that's why it feels authentic because it is. It's authentically representative of the all thousand artists <laughs> who got together and they sent us notes when we were doing something wrong. People spoke up. And you know, I've I've learned in my career that it's a you don't sometimes it is a lot easier. It's a, it's a cliche to say it, but it's a lot easier to um, apologize and ask permission. <laughs> oh, and yeah. and these guys don't ask permission, and that's why I think this film worked. And, and I think all those contributions were made out of a sense of love and generosity for the characters and for the film. You can do this job 
pl af afraid to get in trouble, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> right. And I think that that is a huge mistake. It's so much more fun to think about what can I contribute? What, if I can't contribute that, how, who could we bring into this process to contribute? Like that bendición that's in the movie with Miles and his mom like have a kiss before he leaves. That's like, Cubans do that different than Puerto Ricans. <laughs> Puerto Ricans on the island do that different than like Boricua in New York. I, we had to like, I had to call like six people. <laughs> and by the way, the Puerto Ricans didn't agree on how to do it. <laughs> so it was just about like, if we're, this is a movie about like, like how do we take care of a kid like Miles and make sure he like grows up strong and healthy? Like we all took that approach to the film and to the characters. How do we take care of them and help them thrive and give them all the, you know, give them as much love as we possibly can. And I think when you do that, like you just watch it percolate through the movie. And thank you. I, I, you know, I, just actually looking at the four of you speak about this in close up, as opposed to you know sitting out there or, or, or on uh, on, the, on the camera way back there. I I, I can see the. Um, the determination and the feeling you all have for these characters that you've created, that they, that they, that they exist. It's not, you know, you talk about Miles and Gwen, like Miles and Gwen are real, because they are to everyone who uh, has seen these films and everybody who's worked on them. So I want to thank you all for uh, for sitting here chatting with me and you all for hanging out here thank today. You. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Thanks.